Good evening. Uh, thank you for joining us for the third in our series of online lectures. Before we begin, I should just like to give you um, an update on what's going on at the Atelier. Um, our new Fall 3 session is starting next week and will run for four weeks. Um, Registration is now open. Please check out our website for details. That's the Atelier at flowerfield.org. And the other thing I would like to tell you about is the uh, new upcoming exhibition. Um, we're joining up with the Satorkid artists, so they will be presenting a show running from the first week in December to mid-January. Um, and uh, the other thing I'd like to say is just to welcome Ned Puckner. Um, he is our guest tonight. He will be, uh, he's the director of Gallery North, um, a specialist in African-American art, and he will be giving a talk um, called uh, excuse me, uh, winning the peace over Mr. Prejudice, Horace Pippin and the, the social gospel and the double V. After this lecture, there will be a question and answer period. So please send us your questions via the Q&A box or the chat box. Uh, and just to let you know that this lecture will be recorded and will be posted on our website. So um, I shall now hand you over to Ned Puckner. And I hope you enjoy the lecture. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Nice to be here. My name is Ned Puckner. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you tonight. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Gabby and Brianna and Joan as well for putting this all together. Um, I also want to thank Dave Madigan, who um, was the first to kind of approach me about doing this a long time ago before we all uh, I started isolating ourselves. Um, he saw me speak um, at another venue um, about some of what I've done in the past. And um, just, you know, when, when everything shut down, reached out and uh, invited me to do this. So it's a pleasure to be here and finally um, have a moment to to present some of this work. Um, so what I'm gonna be presenting tonight is um, a paper about uh, Horace Pippin. Um, this is part of um, research that I did years ago when I was a uh, doctoral candidate. Um, and it was part of a series of studies that I did on African-American artists from the modern period, um, all talking about how um, their faith um, and their art helped them to express themselves during a very difficult time, during the modern period when um, things like war, things like um, uh, prejudice and racial discrimination were uh, making life very difficult. So um, this one is on Horace Pippin. There are three other studies that I've done. Um, perhaps sometime in the future, I'll get a chance to present those as well. Um, but um, as um, was mentioned, if you have any questions, um, please enter them into the chat box um, and we will get to them um, when I'm all finished with my uh, PowerPoint and my talk. Um, and I look forward to um, talking with you about it. I hope it spurs some, some good discussion. Okay, so um, let me get going here. And there we go. Okay. A sledgehammer is poised above the head of a grimacing, white, bare-chested man. He is ready and menacingly eager to nail a spike into the middle of a large, wood-colored V, the final blow that would split the V in two. This threatening man is Mr. Prejudice. He exhibits a cold, zealous determination reminiscent of one of Christ's crucifiers as he hammers into the symbolic V. The V, itself a symbol of victory within American society during World War II, is wedged between two equal groups of character types and symbols. In the top left, there is the Statue of Liberty. <clears throat> Her blazing red torch is head high, held high above the V, much as Mr. Prejudice holds aloft his sledgehammer. In the top right, a hooded Klansman peers out at us through lifeless black holes, while a red-shirted, bearded white man with a black hat who holds a noose in his left hand glances to the left at the Statue of Liberty. Liberty herself is given a dark brown hue instead of the usual green, 
mirroring the skin of the African-American she represents and proudly stands above in the painting. And from the right, gathering over the Klansmen and the other representations of white American racial hatred, clouds linger ominously. The bottom half of the canvas is peopled by two groups positioned below the bottom of the V. On the left, a black machinist diligently works away and below him are four figures. The first in the bottom left corner is a surgeon dressed in white, wearing a, white, a face mask who, like the Klansman above, stares out at the viewer. To his left, moving toward the center of the painting, is an African-American World War II naval officer who faces to his left and extends his hand. Next to him is a World War II Air Force pilot looking out at us. And standing proudly to the left of the center is an African-American World War I doughboy who also stares directly out at us. His left arm held akimbo at his side and his left leg slightly advanced as if moving straight toward us. To the right of this group is a similar yet racially different group. From the right side of the V is another white machinist hard at work. Below him in the right corner stands another white World War I, naval, sorry, World War II naval officer who faces to the left. To the left of him are a white World War I doughboy and a World War II pilot who appears to be reaching out his hand toward the African-American serviceman to the left. It is a gesture which is halted by the African-American doughboy standing between these two groups as if the history of World War I symbolized by the soldier were preventing these two groups from shaking hands and working together. Atop them all, Mr. Prejudice stares out at us about to ram the spike which will destroy the V for victory symbol, a slogan so crucial to these military personnel. This figure is positioned at the top of this hierarchy to suggest a final judgment. Mr. Prejudice is about to hand down a verdict stating in no uncertain terms that white society and its prejudice against African-Americans is responsible for the country's inability to vanquish its enemies abroad in World War II. Created amidst fears of racial violence and urban riots that surged across America in 1943, Mr. Prejudice stands alone among several paintings by African-American modern painter Horace Pippin that reference the socio-political context of the late 1930s and early 1940s. It not only engages his own personal history with war, but is also unique for how it overtly protests American racial inequalities and prejudice utilizing motifs stemming from the evangelical church, the black press, and black nationalist sentiments common at the time. In Mr. Prejudice, Horace Pippin confronts American racial hatred to posit a theodicy, that is, to find evidence of divine justice during an, an historical moment inundated with evil. The artist makes a distinct and direct comment on the racial hatred of white Christians and grants African-Americans moral authority over them. This presentation clarifies the complex ideas of Mr. Prejudice by looking at the African-American press and its double V campaign. A central symbol of racial pride and militancy during the early 1940s, this campaign functioned within both the African-American press and the evangelical church. The extent to which it also served as a model for Horace Pippin's Mr. Prejudice can be seen by charting the artist's personal history, his background in the church, as well as his self-professed divine inspiration. I will also discuss the socio-political context and early civil rights movement of the late 1930s and early 1940s, as well as the emergent importance of the African-American press and evangelical church to civil rights militancy during World War II. These elements will in turn demonstrate that Mr. Prejudice is a prime example of the manner in which the protest and moral authority of the African-American church assisted congregants like Horace Pippin to face the evils and unchristian values within American society. Offering symbols of racial pride and religious devotion, it was Pippin's faith that allowed him to speak out against segregation and to support a nationwide effort aimed at winning the peace for racial equality in America after the war. Horace Pippin 
was brought up in a household that encouraged him to say his prayers, read the Bible, play the organ, and attend church on Sunday. Exhibiting an early knowledge of scripture, his, his first artworks when he was a child were biblical scenes. According to local records, as a young boy, Pippin attended the African United Methodist Presbyterian Church of Goshen, New York, where he attended Sunday school. As he moved around in his early childhood between Goshen and Patterson, New Jersey, scholarship, scholarship suggests he remained with the Methodist Church until meeting his wife in 1920. Pippin married Jenny Giles that year, who was a widow with a son named Richard Wade. They all settled in West Chester, Pennsylvania, and attended St. Paul's Baptist Church. Before marrying and settling in West Chester, however, Horace Pippin had fought in World War I. He enlisted in 1917 and became part of the 369th Infantry Regiment of the Army. The 369th was an African-American unit and one of the few segregated regiments to see action in the war. In 1918, Pippin was hit by sniper fire, severely injuring his right arm. He was shipped home before the armistice in 1919, awarded the Croix de Guerre by the French government, and was honorably discharged with a disability pension. After the war, the artist became an active member of the Elks and the American Legion. In the years that followed the war, Pippin's active involvement in these organizations was matched by both his enthusiasm for painting, drawing, and carving, and his close connection to his faith community. Pippin often infused his art with many spiritual themes. With his rise in the art world after 1937, a number of critics, artists, and collectors all remarked on the artist's faith. A reporter for the Baltimore Afro-American newspaper described him as profoundly religious. Pippin's biographers also noted that his, quote, choice of biblical subjects reflects a lifelong piety and a familiarity with scripture that often astonished his friends, end quote. A neighbor recounted that, quote, Mr. Pippin had a strong belief in the emphasis his church placed on healing, end quote. And Claude Clark, an African-American painter, characterized him as a very religious person. And Pippin's faith is easy to find within his paintings. He painted biblical scenes such as crucifixion and Christ before Pilate, and there are even subtle references to religious imagery in Mr. Prejudice. For instance, the painting evokes the crucifixion with its primary antagonist hammering a spike into a wooden structure. The composition contains the classic binary structure of many last, last judgment scenes as well, positioning African-Americans on the bottom left as the righteous and whites on the bottom right as the morally evil. The triangular sculpt structure of the composition too with its figure of Mr. Prejudice at the top African-American soldiers in the bottom left and white soldiers on, in the bottom right, suggests the classic structure of the Holy Trinity, here dominated by a massive authoritarian form of prejudice. And while recent scholars have located religious faith in Pippin's compositions, none have addressed the artist's admission that he was driven by a divine calling to create his art. In a journal entry dated to roughly 1940, the artist Julius Block, after meeting Pippin, wrote, quote, Pippin came to paint because of loneliness, he said, but his talent comes to him from God, who directs his work, and when he has difficulty with it, he prays at night, and the next morning help comes, and the problem is clearer and nearer solution. When I'm through with a picture, he said, I put everything in it I've got to give, end quote. Prayer and divine inspiration were central to Pippin's creative process, but he asserts that his faith here is in fact a form of agency. It is the kind of admission of emotional and intellectual support that is indicative of the heightened experience of a religious conversion common to evangelical communities. During his meeting with Bloch, Pippin implies that he sought the spirit just as many evangelicals had done and continue to do today. This practice, known commonly as spiritual conversion, is a process of finding meaning in the world through faith. It is a practice in which one seeks a life free from suffering, in which, in which one turns away from the world and finds redemption from God. As his statement makes clear, after experiencing conversion, Pippin then adapted this significant experience into a narrative of divine inspiration that guided his artistic production. The evangelical church had been a defining element in Pippin's life and his art. 
Yet understanding the nature of the church and its ministry is important here, precisely because it experienced fundamental change in the years leading up to World War II. There had been a significant shift within the Na National Baptist Convention toward the social gospel movement, a movement generated out of concern for the total life experience of its worshipers. Ministers of the social gospel, for example, strove to enhance the church's promotion of African-American education and garner general support for the social, moral, political, and cultural uplift of its congregants. At thousands of black churches across the country, social gospel tenets emphasize aspects of moral law, black nationalism, and racial identity. With the help of this movement, evangelical sermons built a stronger dynamic around the relationship between scriptural reference and contemporary life. As Linda Roscoe Hartigan writes, evangelical African-American preachers established a mode of sermonizing that utilized a scriptural precedent to illuminate either contemporary dilemmas, everyday events, or pressing, pressing issues of morality. Alternatively, they might also use a secular context to explain a complex religious concept. Raised in the church at the exact moment when these changes occurred, Pippin not surprisingly chose to utilize this mode of sermonizing in his art. His education on inequalities, nationalism, and racial identity in the church led to artworks which set issues in the contemporary world against verses of scripture. Pippin's Holy Mountain series, for example, juxtaposes the Old Testament narratives of the prophet Isaiah against a contemporary dilemma. In a letter, Pippin explained the Holy Mountain to the knowledge of God, seen here, by saying, quote, this seeing the world as it is today caused me to paint this picture. If you will, if you will notice on the left-hand corner of the picture, you will see the struggle that we went through in 1917 and 1918. And further to the extreme left, you will see what they did and are still doing in the South. Looking at Isaiah 16th chapter 6 verse, I got this picture. Speaking of peace, Isaiah tells us that the knowledge of God shall be as deep upon the earth as the waters are on the sea. And it makes you wonder, do men have the knowledge of God today? That's why I painted this picture, end quote. Along the top of the painting, we see small planes dropping bombs in the darkness. Below, in the obscurity of the trees on the left, we can also barely discern soldiers creeping amidst the trees and a lynching victim hanging dead on a noose. Pippin contrasts these painful scenes against scripture that affirms mankind's faith. He creates a rift between what is and what should be, between what exists and what is divinely ordained, between the racial violence in the South, his memories of World War I, and the current war. Pippin points to this rift to brashly indict humanity, confirming that it must be devoid of the knowledge of God. It is noteworthy that the imagery referencing racial violence and war is embedded deep in the background, however, veiled behind a dark screen of trees. Did Pippin intend this comment to go unnoticed for some reason? Why did his letter draw issues that were so shrouded in the actual painting? And what men is he addressing exactly when he writes, do men have the knowledge of God today? Alluding to events happening in the South, the context suggests that Pippin is addressing white men specifically, critiquing American racial inequality, especially among white Christians. According to W.E.B. Du Bois, African-Americans saw whites as suffering from an ethical paradox. As he wrote, quote, there is no more pitiable paradox than that of the young white Christian in the South today who really believes in the ethics of Jesus Christ. Who could doubt that if Christ came to Georgia today, one of his first deeds would be to sit down and take supper with black men? And who could doubt the outcome if he did?" End quote. On the one hand, white Christians are God-fearing men and women who professed to love thy neighbor and who valued righteousness in the face of the brotherhood of man. On the other, they categorically excluded African Americans from that holy covenant. It was through this perspective of white Christianity that many African Americans, artists, and writers were able to outwardly question their normative construction of the white condition in veiled ways. To view Pippin's art as engaging protest themes 
is also, also to view his work as questioning the paradox of white Christianity. Moreover, the protest against racial inequalities in America for Pippin also became synonymous with questions of divine justice during World War II, questions which linger beneath the surface of Mr. Prejudice. Injured in battle during World War I, Horace Pippin returned to the home front wounded in 1918. Canonical accounts of the artist after his military service state that he was simply out of work and because of his imagery, uh, his injury, went to live with his mother's family in Westchester, Pennsylvania. It is also likely that Pippin, like many other returning African-American veterans, experienced intense racial discrimination, barring him from finding work. There were widespread clashes between African-Americans and lower class whites between 1917 and 1919. While much of this violence derived from the migration of African-Americans from the South, many attacks were against black soldiers. Black veterans began to fight back against discriminatory job policies and racial attacks perpetrated by the whites. In Chicago, the city which received the largest influx of migrant African-Americans, there were more than 24 bomb attacks on homes. After the war, during what's known as the Red Summer of 1919, there were more than 20 race riots in different cities across the country. The worst took place in Chicago, where 38 people were killed and over 500 injured in a riot, which lasted six days. Lynchings, which had risen in number from 38 in 1917 to 64 in 1918, reached a height of 83 in 1919. Among the victims of such attacks were a number of black soldiers, some of whom were still in uniform. In many cases, the simple fact that black soldiers had fought for democracy abroad stirred them to fight back. As one historian writes, quote, black soldiers returning from France where they had been decorated for their contribution to the war effort in 1919 refused to accept the injustices they thought they had fought to abolish for all peoples, end quote. Yet scholarship depicts Pippin's return home, return home as almost aimless, a moment when the artist was living off a veteran's check and his wife's income. It is hard to believe that Pippin was simply out of work, just as it is unlikely the artist was, a, was unaware of what his fellow infantrymen experienced in the years following World War I. The bombing of Pearl Harbor in 1941 certainly rekindled this historical moment, reifying both war and discrimination as important topics in Pippin's art. The artist had, in fact, consistently addressed war subjects from his first painting, seen here on the top left, The End of War Starting Home from around 1930, to later works such as A Tribute to Stalingrad. The Elks Club and the American Legion also played a role in connecting him to his military past. In the early 1940s, these organizations likely encouraged Pippin's involvement in contemporary military issues. As a result, Pippin was not only aware of what Pearl Harbor, Pearl Harbor meant for the country, but more specifically, he knew how such a global conflict would affect African Americans. In the years running up to World War II, African Americans suffered great disadvantages. As one historian writes, quote, after being first fired during the Depression, African Americans now found themselves last hired, discriminated against in government training programs, excluded from many unions, and forced into the dirtiest and lowest paying jobs. To make matters worse, as the Depression in white America officially ended, the federal government drastically slashed welfare appropriations, despite the fact that many Black people remained unemployed or underemployed, end quote. Migration from the South to escape Jim Crow laws, lynching, and mob violence was ongoing during World War II. Hundreds of thousands of African Americans sought work in the North and the West as the United States entered the war and ramped up its defense industry. In addition, there was a parallel migration of poor Southern whites also needing jobs and housing. The demographics resulting from this continued migration led to increased racial tensions in Northern and Western cities, which were unable to accommodate the influx. And as federal housing projects began, clashes over the location and racial composition of this housing quickly surfaced. While the country was facing a worldwide crisis, African-Americans were experiencing a crisis on the home front. 
along with these unemployment and housing concerns, other concerns like participation in the war effort, even morale for the war were debated constantly. Out of these concerns came activism, which was focused on increased representation in the armed services and discrimination in defense industry jobs. Before World War II, the US government had largely prevented African Americans from fighting in armed conflicts, allowing only limited segregated regiments supervised by white officers. This discriminatory policy undermined African American sense of citizenship, a feeling that became acute in the early 1940s. By 1941, African American men were still prevented from joining the Marines, the Coast Guard, and the Air Corps. The Navy would only accept them as cooks and the army limited them to four units in which openings seldom occurred. In reaction to these policies, many black organizers, religious leaders, and the black press supported a quota movement by which representation of black, black soldiers in the armed forces would be proportionate to their population. Together with the press, leaders of the movement organized a committee of representatives from black fraternities, American Legion posts, the YMCA, and other groups to lobby Congress and the, pre and the president. This lobbying was successful and the draft bill of 1940 included a mandatory 10% black quota. Right after the Pearl Harbor attack though, 30,000 African-Americans were passed over in the first month's draft call, as many who had volunteered for the army were turned down. The army never met its promised quota. At most only 5% of the total number of GIs was African-American and, only eight, and over 80% of them were stationed in the United States. According to historians, African-Americans were not shipped overseas because at the time, ranking officials in the military believed them to be inferior soldiers. And the selective service system, which served as the Army's selection agency, did not remedy the situation until increased draft calls began at the end of 1942. In reaction to being turned down and underutilized, this activism increased. There was also significant activism against dis discrimination in defense industry jobs. Prior to the Pearl Harbor attack, A. Philip Randolph, a union leader and president of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, announced his March on Washington movement, which sought an end to such discrimination. The march was discussed in evangelical churches nationwide and covered in major African-American newspapers. The Afro-American, for example, called on the NAACP, the Elks, and the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. As news of the march spread across the nation, Roosevelt reacted by establishing the Fair Employment uh, Practices Committee by executive order. This included a declaration against discrimination and unemployment and the employment of workers in defense industries due to race, creed, color, and national origin. But the reception of this order was mixed, however, and in the following months and years, it led to strikes, riots, and other forms of racial violence when its policies were enforced without government intervention. In addition to this order, the needs of the war effort abroad ultimately led to the lifting of racial quotas within different branches of the military. The need for soldiers increased in late 1942, but not uniformly. At first, only the Army reversed its policy. The Air Corps and Navy were more reluctant. After continuous pressure from, by the Black Press and NAACP, the Air Corps established a segregated center at Tuskegee. The Navy was even more stubborn, though. Until January 1942, African Americans could serve only as cooks. Um, later, a few African Americans were allowed to serve in other capacities. Not until March 1943 did naval policy conform to. Uh, uh, the Army's plan of accepting African Americans up to 10% of its manpower. Meanwhile, in the Army, the number of Black servicemen rose dramatically from, from 98,000 in late 1941 to 468,000 in late 1942. And by November 1942, 1942, they were involved in combat in the South Pacific and North, North Africa. And African American women were also accepted into the newly created Women's Army Auxiliary Corps and even the Red Cross began collecting blood from African Americans as well, which was another big topic at the time. Despite these significant advances, riots on military bases became world, a worldwide phenomenon. On training camps and base camps, um, African Americans were mistreated by officers or white enlisted men. 
when these black soldiers protested, they were harassed or intimidated. Whenever these African Americans became persistent and seeking answers, they were transferred, placed in the stockade, or dishonorably discharged. The War Department received regular reports of low morale among African American soldiers because of this widespread harassment. And it is clear that Black soldiers increasingly fought back. As one historian suggests, quote, rioting became commonplace at nearly every army base in the South, many in the North, and even at a few in Australia, England, and the South Pacific, end quote. Race riots at base camps dominated the front pages of, Af of the African-American press and accelerated in 1942. At the same time, an equal amount of interracial violence occurred in the cities. Faced with the new policies from the Fair Employment Practices Committee, the defense industry saw increases in racial violence after 1941 nationwide. And by 1943, the violence had ballooned and became a hot topic in the press and in the church. It was felt that the executive order was never enforced and met with great opposition on local levels. Consequently, the lost hope of government assistance increased much of the violence as the new executive order did little to convince black people that the federal government was behind their efforts to gain equal job opportunities. In 1943, there were 242 racial battles in 47 cities, including violence in Philadelphia, Newark, Los Angeles, and Buffalo. Verbal abuse, shovings, slappings, and stabbings became everyday happenings, signifying a heightened racial animosity. Outbreaks of violence were almost indiscriminate, and in many cases derived from the conditions within American society in general. There were clashes between servicemen of both races, between black soldiers and white policemen or civilians, and between black and white workers. People of all races were working long hours, subjected to rationing, irritated by shortages of material goods, and if not drafted themselves, likely to have a relative or friend sent off to face the perils of armed conflict. The war contributed directly and indirectly to a powder keg atmosphere, and it only took fairly trivial incidents on hot days to provide the spark. The worst of the violence was in the summer of 1943. In June, 75% of Detroit was inundated with rioters who burned and looted the city. In addition, amidst fears of comp competition for jobs, a strike at Sun Shipbuilding Yards in Chester, Pennsylvania, ended in violent battles, bringing the violence very close to home for Horace Pippin, living in nearby Westchester. The crisis on the home front was national in scope, but had genuine repercussions for Horace Pippin and his family. In 1943, Pippin's own stepson, Richard Wade, enlisted in the military amidst this moment of outright rioting throughout the country. This no doubt drastically altered the artist's relationship with the crisis, making it and Mr. Prejudice highly personal. Reviewing all these details, it is clear that this pervasive crisis affected Pippin personally and informed the creation of Mr. Prejudice in several ways. First, as mentioned earlier, the newspapers called on the Elks and the American Legion to participate in the quota and March on Washington movements. These, are local, these were local organizations in which Pippin was active. Second, the Navy's stubborn policies to implement quotas in, to stubborn policies to implement quotas until March 1943 explains Pippin's inclusion of a naval officer in his painting. It is not notable that he is the only African American figure turning to extend his hand to the white servicemen. Halting the meeting of these two factions in this composition, Pippin suggests that these two sides will never agree. Lastly, the rioting at the Sun Shipbuilding Company, only miles from Pippin's hometown of Westchester, explain why, explains why machinists are so central to the composition of Mr. Prejudice. This strike occurred right before Pippin made this painting. Such compositional choices clearly signify where Pippin found the war, the war on prejudice playing out in American society. And these choices were informed to a large extent by black newspapers. By World War II, the African-American press was reaching millions of readers, and almost half of the circulation consisted of three enormously popular papers, the Pittsburgh Courier, the Chicago Defender, and the Baltimore Afro-American. 
the success of these and other newspapers derived from their unique role in, de in detailing the African-American experience in a way that had not previously existed, offering basic information on African-Americans that went unmentioned in the white press. By simply stating the facts about black unemployment, about the level of disenfranchisement in the military, or about the extent of racial violence nationwide, the press changed the tenor of African-American life and affected the relationship between African-Americans and the war effort. The manner in which African-American newspapers addressed the war and segregation underwent important shifts before World War II. Years before, during World War I, W.E.B. Du Bois called on African-Americans to close ranks with white America and forego protests during the war. This meant, quote, first your country, then your rights, end quote, and suggested that one's country should come first and that liberation would eventually be awarded through participation in the armed forces. He asked black people to forego pushing their complaints while the war raged, confident that racial prejudice would disappear as a result of their service fighting alongside white people. Yet in World War I, African-Americans did not serve alongside whites. They were segregated into separate units like the 369th in which Pippin fought. Moreover, as the nation pondered another global conflict in late 1941, the violence that followed the previous war generated tremendous debate. Many felt that if they refused to fight, the result would be disastrous. They would never claim nor be entitled to the fruits of victory. Echoing the arguments years earlier, the black press took the position that black people were Americans first and quote, Negroes second, end quote. This brand of net black nationalism within the press played to the attitudes of its readers nationwide and quickly seeped into their rallying campaigns for the war. The double V campaign of the Pittsburgh Courier was one such large scale effort aimed at affecting change and serving as a counterpoint to the larger V for victory campaign. On January 31st, 1942, less than two months after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, the Pittsburgh Courier published a letter to the editor from James Thompson entitled, Should I Sacrifice to Live Half American? Advancing the idea that African-Americans should come together to adopt their own racially specific symbol of patriotism, Pippin, um, Thompson wrote, quote, the V for victory is being displayed prominently in all so-called democratic countries, which are fighting for victory over aggression, slavery, and tyranny. If this V sign means the, that to those now engaged in this great conflict, then that we colored Americans adopt a double V for a double victory. The first V for victory over our enemies from without, the second V for victory over our enemies from within." End quote. A complex position within the black press, the double V was designed to counter the militancy among those African-Americans who were mobilizing against Jim Crow laws and who were incensed by the increased race riots after the summer of 1941. It was a call from African-American leaders to serve as equals in the armed forces in order to gain eventual equality. The idea that the double V was, the idea of the double V was rapidly picked up in the black press during the winter of 1942. After Thompson's letter, the Pittsburgh Courier followed with their rendition of a symbol for this double V, placing it in the top left corner of the cover page. With its strong American symbolism of an eagle, wings spread apart below the word democracy, the image of the double V was a rallying patriotic symbol, appearing throughout the paper after this initial appearance, variants on the image and the idea spread quickly to other newspapers as did the rhetoric around it. <clears throat> the next Saturday, February 14th, which was Valentine's Day, the Courier published four photographs of young women raising both hands, forming double Vs with their fingers, with the caption, quote, these lovely Debs have joined double V campaign, victory for race and country, end quote. The symbol had spread to now become a gesture of racial patriotism. In the same issue, another photograph showed Beatrice Williams, who had been crowned Miss Bronze America of 1941, contor contorting her whole body to form these with her fingers, arms, and legs. In the following issue, several letters by readers from areas as widespread as New York, Wichita, 
Toledo, Los Angeles, and Philadelphia were published. They congratulated the Courier for its creation of the double V emblem and suggested that it be used on automobiles, letterheads, club sweaters, and pins. Eventually, the Courier and other organizations created a culture around this emblem of racial pride that included car stickers, buttons, blotters, and even recorded songs. Clearly a successful emblem of racial pride, this symbol became ubiquitous, even leading to large-scale rallies that reached from Harlem, New York to Evansville, Indiana. So by contrast, while the excitement over the V for Victory slogan, slogan spread to all sectors of white America, a different racially specific symbol was adopted by the African American community and had a huge impact due to the large circulation of the courier. Horace Pippin was clearly familiar with this symbol, especially when we look closely at his painting, Victory Vase, seen here, done in the early months of 1942. While the painting seems like a straightforward still life, Pippin includes details at the base of the vase that allude to war. Military aircraft decorate the front surface of the central vase, while soldiers, guns drawn, and bayonets of the ready extend from its sides. The shape of the vase itself forms a perfect V, and its base also depicts a stationary tank. Underneath these symbols of war, laced into the doily, are two discernible Vs, creating his painting exactly when the press disseminated the symbol nationwide, Horace Pippin literally laced the symbol into his artwork. Whether Victory Vase reflects a general optimism toward this symbol is hard to discern, however. Given the artist's association of it with a peaceful, blossoming, and vibrant still life, one might think Pippin's perception of the symbol was a positive one, linked to a collective hope. Yet the realities of the double V still called for a war at home. Between the spring of 1942, when Pippin is recorded as creating this painting, and 1943, when he finished Mr. Prejudice, the increase in racial battles nationwide became an obvious indication to anyone reading the African American, reading African -American news, newspapers that the battle to win the peace was being lost and needed greater attention. While Victory Vase appears to be a genuine image of support for the dual effort against racism at home and tyranny abroad, Pippin's later works do not share this attitude. They instead complicate the issue and emphasize the problems inherent in a double victory. Mr. Prejudice creates powerful contrasts that emphasize who the protagonists and victims are within the struggle against prejudice in American society. Their faces stare blankly out at the viewer, each forcefully indicting democracy, urging American society to shed its deeply embedded prejudice in favor of a more progressive idea of social reform. Yet comparing its political stance to that of victory base is compelling. While the earlier painting includes the double V and evokes a somewhat positive, peaceful stance towards, stance towards symbolism, the later painting with its single V appears to be focused solely on the victory over prejudice. It is not, as the double V campaign intended, engaging in a balanced debate that continues to protest prejudice while also encouraging total commitment to the war effort. At the bottom of the painting, the handshake between the two racially different, different groups is clearly blocked. The World War I doughboy and the memory of racial violence after the First World War stand in the way. Pippin's intent focus on prejudice in this instance puts forth a stubborn personification of racism. Mr. Prejudice exudes the character in the, in the painting, exudes the very character of prejudice described in 1909 by Bishop Lucius Henry Halsey of the Amy Church as, quote, deaf to reason and to all appeals who upon grounds of justice, equality, and the high principles of righteousness and mercy. Christianity, he wrote, stands appalled in the shadows of prejudice <clears throat> and quails before its grim visage. It denies and despises the brotherhood of man and the fatherhood of God, end quote. Pippin questions the nature of prejudice, and like Halsey, he views prejudice and the war to win the peace in religious terms. Campaigns like the Double V were successful because of the widespread reach of African-American newspapers, because the press was a resource on which entire communities depended. By focusing on their news on issues crucial to the African-American community, 
the black press became one of the leading black industries, second only to the black church. And as the war effort deepened, the press industry not only realized its role in large scale efforts to affect change, it also joined forces with the church. One month after the Double V campaign was launched, the National Baptist Convention sent out sermons to be read on Easter Sunday in hopes of making this Christian holiday into National Negro Double Victory Day. They collaborated with other national organizations to reach over 40,000 churches and 3 million followers across the country. In the press, organizers issued, quote, a clarion call for justice, enfranchisement, equal education opportunities and salaries, unrestricted participation in the armed forces, and employment in all defense industries, end quote. Uniting the double V with the enormous influence of the church, this Easter celebration connected black nationalism and religious faith on an unprecedented scale. Moreover, in the Courier's March 28th issue, along with this announcement, there was an editorial cartoon entitled, He Shall Come With Victory, which you see here, with a subtitle that read, quote, this is a double V scene. Its import and significance in the current struggle cannot be disassociated from its spiritual implications as expressed in Revelations, end quote. The black and white image illustrated two silhouette figures, silhouetted figures, each with arms raised as if in prayer in the bottom right corner. At the top left, a floating image of Jesus, robed in flowing white cloth and bathed in light appears. In each hand, he holds a V, emerging with the twin victories over discrimination at home and tyranny abroad. It suggested that God would bring these twin victories through the second coming of Christ, as stated in the book of Revelations a text which itself associates Christ's return with a final judgment on humanity. The details of the National Negro Double Victory Day campaign demonstrate one example of how on a local level, Horace Pippin became aware of larger political concerns through his local church. It reveals how matters of everyday life, issues regarding the war abroad and racial discrimination on the home front, all informed his church activities. In like manner, the campaign reveals how the, the racialized theological discourse of evangelicalism was inserted into concentrated themes of protest for African-Americans, creating themes of faith-based protest. The active involvement of the black church in the double V effort, the association of the double V with the second coming of Christ and the national excitement on Easter for a double victory sermonized in the church all helped Pippin understand the issue of prejudice in religious terms. In light of both this context and the close connection between the double V and Pippin's art and faith, Mr. Prejudice should be seen as an exercise in theodicy. That is, an effort to find evidence of divine justice. Pippin's interrogation of white Christianity is manifested in Mr. Prejudice with a forthright central figure and cast of antagonists and protagonists who each reflect on common or comment on values that were unchristian. The painting presents the face of moral evil in the world, a functional image questioning divine justice and reassessing good and evil. It realigns a complex moral landscape at a difficult historic moment. With its religious undercurrent, Pippin's Mr. Prejudice reifies a Christian moral code that has gone astray, using Christian dogma as a means to survive in a world rife with discrimination and violence clarifying the relationship between divine justice and moral evil, such a theodicy reflects, reflexively looks back on religion for the ways in which it brings out issues of equality. Similarly, Mr. Prejudice reflexively looks back upon the war for how it brought about the issue of prejudice and equality, brought the issue of prejudice and equality to the surface. It also looks back on the dire circumstances of nearby race riots and Chester, Pennsylvania, and on a son enlisted in an army within which violent attacks on African Americans were widespread and regular. The war abroad and the war at home became inseparable from Pippin's faith and his art. Religious experience shapes an individual's sense of ultimate meaning. Through his own religious experience, his, Horace Pippin found meaning in the rampant racial discrimination that was bursting the seams of American society. He understood prejudice, equality, and black nationalism in terms of a faith that offered peace and healing. Within religion, the artist found testaments to the moral clarity of African-Americans, 
joining the sacred and the secular under the direction of a divine inspiration, Horace Pippin utilized his faith to respond to violence through his art, weighing white Christianity against the evidence of its failure in America in general and in, mili in the military in particular. Personified in mystery prejudice, this failure only reasserted the importance of his faith and later his knowledge of God. It was through his faith that Pippin understood justice and indeed it was through this faith that African Americans could win the peace. Thank you so much. That's everything. Um, I will stop that share. Um, I hope you all enjoyed that. Um, it's been a pleasure to speak. I, um, we do see. have a question. There you are, okay. Okay, so I'm gonna read that out for you. This comes from Kellen Alder. Can you talk a little bit about how Pippin influenced other artists like Kerry James Marshall? Um, sure, well, I think it was really um, this mode of expression, the, the fact that he kind of uh, so brashly um, addressed issues at a very difficult and very restricted time um, that dealt with racial equality. Um, I, I don't think that it was um, uh, necessarily a formal influence, although you could make that argument, but I think it was more an ideological one. Um, he actually, Kerry James Marshall wrote an essay about um, Horace Pippin um, in recent years, um, talking about um, how he, how sort of the mode of expression really um, helped him to um, address some of the more raw, um, uh, sensitive, rawly sensitive um, issues that, that he deals with in his own work. And I actually, um, I can let people chat um, so I can allow Kellen to speak. Kellen, you're on. Do you want to say anything more? Are you there? I think her, yeah, her, her speak is mute. Can you unmute yourself, Kellen? No? I wonder if I can do that. Let me see. Hang on, I'm going to unmute. I'm trying to, but I can't from my end. Um, but yeah, there was a, an exhibition. Um, I think Kellen's now unmuted. Are you there? Kellen? I'm not hearing anything on my end. Either. No. Um, but yeah, there was an exhibition um, in, um, what was it, 2015? Um, 2016 um, that happened at the Brandywine Museum um, and I was uh, very fortunate to have um, portions of this essay um, in the catalog for it and I think Ke Kerry James Marshall also uh, wrote a short essay um, about Pippin as, and his influence um, in that catalog as well um, and that I think is the um, one of the more recent um, uh, surveys of Pippin's work. Um, yeah. Oh, you're having tech issues. Okay, okay. So anyway, thank you very much for, for that. Um, if anyone would like to see that catalog, I'm happy to um, uh, share it um, with you. Um, I think you can probably access the essay um, online, probably. Any other questions? I don't see any other questions. Mm. Well, um, you know, I'll just, I'll talk a little bit more about, um, you know, the, the larger study um, that this is a, a part of. Um, okay. Um, and so I, you know, I, I talk about self-taught artists. Um, Horace Pippin was, um, as I mentioned, he had a, his, his, um, um, artwork became um, very important to the art world in 1937. Um, at that time, um, self-taught artists were um, 
somewhat of a, you know, a, an interest of the art world. Um, there were formal, I mean, the, at the time, there was a, a big interest in um, sort of native aesthetics, um, native uh, to, New, to the US. Um, there were a number of um, painter, modern painters, including Charles Sheeler, Yasuo Kuniyoshi, um, and several others um, who were interested in trying to find uh, what was called a usable past um, and um, try to find like a design aesthetic or a, you know, an, an inherently American aesthetic. And um, that's what sort of prompted an interest in folk art. And Pippin and other artists um, were seen as sort of an extension of that, like a contemporary example of, of folk art happening right, right then and there. And so when, uh, for instance, the MoMA, uh, the Museum of Modern Art, started in 1929, um, one of their first exhibits was of folk art because it was so um, inherently interesting to um, modernism, American modernism, that they wanted to present it as a way to um, help uh, modernists of the time to uh, learn from the past and create a modernism that was specifically American. Um, and so Pippin um, played a large role. Another artist named William Edmondson played a large role in how that sort of um, happened in museums. Um, and um, so the interest in his work really kind of, or his work really skyrocketed, skyrocketed in, the, in the art world um, after 1937. So, um, there was a sort of very interesting interplay between um, Horace Pippin creating his own work and then Horace Pippin also creating work that reacted to all this um, increased attention. And so one of the things that um, goes sort of unmentioned in, in the talk that I just gave was about the knowledge of God, um, that, that um, Holy Mountain series that he created after Mr. Prejudice when um, the statements that he was making about race, about violence, about um, discrimination became more veiled. Um, whereas with Mr. Prejudice, it's pretty much right there on the surface. And um, so it's just, it, it, Pippin plays this really interesting role um, early on. And at the same time, there were many other artists that were creating at the same time who did not get as well uh, promoted and were not as influenced um, by the art world. So William Edmondson um, had a show. He was the first African-American to ever show at the Museum of Modern Art. He had a show also in 1937. Um, it happened uh, in the basement of MoMA um, and there was no catalog done or anything. Um, and then he was kind of seemingly forgotten for many years until um, the self-taught field, or otherwise known as the out outsider art field, uh, the folk art field, they all sort of coalesced um, in the late 70s and early 80s. And um, those artists that had been creating in the modern period became more well known. So William Edmondson now is this sort of titan um, of, of self-taught artists, um, but he was creating all of his work in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, he was, um, also dealing with racial discrimination. He was also part of an evangelical community. Um, he was also in a, you know, a big city that was dealing with, the, with modern changes where the city was becoming, was you know, gobbling up the rural, the rural um, areas around Nashville. Um, and he was sort of stuck in the middle trying to make sense of, um, of the changes that were happening around him. Um, another artist, Minnie Evans, who was living in Wilmington, North Carolina. Uh, she also was living in a small town. She was also creating art um, at a time when the world around her was changing dramatically. She lived in Wilmington, North Carolina, which, um, uh, like Pippin's area, was um, very affected by the war. Um, the population of Wilmington, um, because of the defense industry, quadrupled in two years. It went from this tiny, small little uh, marginally rural town to a, uh, you know, a modern urban town. Um, there were planes going over uh, 
the, the city and Mindy Evans saw her first airplane fly over. There were bombs going off in the distance. Uh, there were U-boats that were threatening to uh, take out um, uh, the military uh, encampments that were near the city. Um, and she was sort of stuck in the middle of it, trying to make sense of it. And like Pippin, like Edmondson, uh, turned towards um, her religious faith and created artworks that were both religious, but also um, dealing with the world around her. Um, and then the, um, the, third, the fourth artist, rather, was Elijah Pierce, um, another artist that started creating works in the 20s um, and created works um, up until the 70s and the um, early 80s. Um, he was a wood carver who was a, actually a, a, an itinerant preacher um, and um, created a storefront um, uh, religious uh, presentation with his wife in the 20s that um, uh, was also kind of in the same sort of milieu where he was living in a town that was rapidly growing. Um, he had been raised um, in the church and became sort of a pseudo itinerant preacher. And as the city grew, he created this sort of um, small um, uh, church that was um, instead of creating instead of um, creating a church atmosphere, he just carved these um, religious scenes, these bas relief uh, wooden uh, religious scenes, and put them up all around in the in this um, small little space, and and would uh, conduct church services with his wife, and. Um, he also um, uh, was trying to make sense of, uh, in, in later years, was trying to make sense of the world through his art for his congregants. And so all four of them have this sort of uh, interesting um, interweaving, these interesting interweaving lives that all speak to the fact that, um, that here you have um, different artworks being created, but it's, it's um, essentially a, a religious aesthetic and evangelical art of the modern period that is really homegrown. It's sort of a grassroots, um, uh, um, it's, it's really a grassroots sort of, I don't want to say movement, but it was a, but it was a, a result of um, the lives that um, everyone was, was experiencing, the African American experience and the commonalities between them and the fact that that religion made, helped make sense of all of these changes and helped sort of guide them through this difficult period um, and, you know, in many ways led up to the civil rights movement. Um, you know, this activism during the war, people like A. Philip Randolph, um, they played a very large role in the actual civil rights movement in the 50s and the 60s. Um, the March on Washington movement, um, they reused that um, after the war and, you know, that led to um, the March on Washington that we know of, um, with Martin Luther King giving a speech, leading to the the um, the um, you know the the voting rights laws and and all that. So um, it's a very interesting time. These four artists um, played a uh, interesting role in in documenting the African American experience and um, created art that, in many ways, was unique in how it reflected and tells us, teaches us about this history in really interesting ways on a very local level. Um, they were all working in small cities, um, Westchester, Pennsylvania, Columbus, Elijah Pierce was in Columbus, Ohio, um, William Edmondson was in um, uh, Nashville, Tennessee, and um, Minnie Evans was in Wilmington, North Carolina. So these were all um, artworks that were created outside of the well-known New York um, Art Center, the or Chicago or DC, where um, you know a lot of uh, art that we know of um, was was being created. It was sort of outside the realm of of the art world. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to share that and create sort of a larger context for this study. Um, anyway, I do want to thank you all for. Um, uh, listening in today. Um, I also should do a plug for Gallery North. Uh, this show being shown behind me is an old one from before the pandemic. We have another show that's just opened today. 
it's a holiday exhibition, so please come by and see that. Um, and I want to thank the Atelier for hosting me tonight. Um, again, thank you to um, Gabby and Brianna and Joan and David and everybody over at Atelier. Thank you so much. And we'd like to thank you very much for a very illuminating lecture. It's been a pleasure hosting you. Um, and uh, I would just uh, ask everyone to check out the website um, for our future lectures. The next one will be coming up in December 15th. Um, and uh, thank you very much and good night.